Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, everybody's church. We're so happy that uh, even though it was a rainy morning, you found the energy to get here or turn on the computer and you did good. We'd love to have you here. Um, lots of things in First Things. Uh, take a look through. Those of you who have little ones, the nursery starts next week, um, and we're going to have nursery at both services, so uh, if their nap time is 10 o'clock, you can come a little bit earlier. Uh, we are going to have a mini golf uh, outing tomorrow if it's raining like this. We have a makeup date, so um, we will get there and it will be wonderful. We have kickoff, we have a new handbell choir starting. I mean, there is just tons and tons of stuff in here. One other thing I'll highlight is these talkabouts. Uh, these are online, and I pick a subject to talk about every month, last Thursday of the month. I'll be live on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you have questions that you want to ask me before, I'll keep them anonymous. You can email them to me, or you can ask them in the chats on those different platforms. This month's topic is the pastor search process. So we're going to talk about what that is in the Presbyterian Church and what it will look like for us. Um, so if you have questions about that, you're not sure how this, the next couple of months are going to look, um, please join us online and we'll talk about it. And if there's another topic you want me to talk about, I don't have my September talk about topic yet, so I would love to do whatever you want to talk about as well. With those announcements, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. in your bulletin. The Lord is merciful. God knows how we can pray and remember that we are blessed. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is abounding in steadfast love. Bless the Lord, all God's works in all places. Join in worship.
Please be seated. One of the realities of human beings is, is that we tend to gather with people who are just like us. We are tribal in nature. Uh, this is the reason in, in high school and elsewhere there are cliques because we just feel comfortable with those folks. And yet God calls us to be an expansive community in which we invite in all of God's people. And so I invite you to join with me in the prayer of confession as we acknowledge that sometimes our lives aren't always as they ought to be. Let us pray together. God, your unbound creation can be overwhelming. When we hear anything is possible, we have responded with anxiety. We have spent more time enforcing policy and etiquette instead of challenging definitions and regulations. We want to stand taller and walk truer towards the world you desire. Now let us pray silently. Amen. Jesus Christ came into the world not to condemn, but to save. So believe the good news that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. I'll have the kids come up and join me uh, at the front. And um, it's like we sort of planned this because my whole message is about why do we do things the way we do them and why don't we do them differently? And we just did something a little bit differently than we normally do. You guys got to stay for the confession prayer, which is super fun. Got to uh, peek into what we do after you guys leave. So what I want you to do first, so I want you to take your hands, put them together like you're going to pray, like they're folded. Okay, now let me see. You have, what is that, your left pinky that's closest to me? Stephanie, your right one looks like this is a right, right, left, left, right, right. You all have a little bit of a different way to fold your hands. How interesting. Okay, I'm going to challenge you to do something different. Take your hands. Open your fingers back up, and I want you to move your fingers just one slot over so that you have a different position. Does that feel weird? Kind of. Maybe some of us are a little bit more comfortable with change. That feels weird to me. This was how I just want to do it. Just, I didn't, no one taught me that. Just naturally how I want to fold my hands. But if I try, I get a little bit uncomfortable with a different way to fold my hands. Sometimes in life, and especially when we are people of faith trying to create a world like heaven, we have to be a little bit uncomfortable because there's people around us that are uncomfortable with the things that we are comfortable with. So there's lots of different kinds of bodies and different kinds of styles. We wanna make sure that our world is welcoming and comfortable for everyone which sometimes means we have to be uncomfortable so that we can make the world different. So if you do this every day and go back and forth real quick, you'll be able to teach yourself that either way feels fine. We just have to kind of go back and forth sometimes. That's your challenge for the week. <laughs> Let's pray. You can either pray with your hands in a comfortable position, or if you want, you can switch and go the other way. Repeat after me. 
Hello, God. Thank you for creating me exactly as I am. And thank you for creating others differently than I am. Let's all be friends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great. You guys can go off to Sunday school. We'll see you later. Please join me in the prayer for illumination printed in your bulletin. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Spirit of wisdom, free us from asking why, even in the spaces where why feels so dangerous, especially as we hear holy words. Let why be our key to you. Amen. First Testament lesson is from Isaiah chapter five, uh, 58, verses um, 9 through 14, which can be found in, on page 688 in the Old Testament in your pew Bible. Listen to the word of the Lord. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places it and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters never fail your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt you shall raise up the foundations of many generations you shall be called the preparer the repair of the breach the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord and, in, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will, I will fill, fill you with uh, the inheritance of your ancestor Jacob for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord.
to follow that one. Um, let's try. I'm going to say a word. Uh, no, I'm going to read the scripture first. <laughs> We're reading from Luke. And we are meeting Jesus and his disciples in the synagogue. So let us listen to what the scripture has for us to hear today. Now, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on one of those days and be cured. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrite. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The word of the Lord. God. Now I'm going to give you a word, and I want you to sit with that word, and I want you to notice what emotions come up, what images come up, what feelings. When I say the word freedom, if I personified freedom, I would think that freedom wants to be very simple. Freedom wants to be clear and accessible for everyone. But I'm not a mind reader, but I'm pretty sure we did not all have the same idea of what freedom was. Freedom wants to be simple, but in practice, freedom is very complicated. But I bet it also sits pretty high on all of our value systems. Not just because of the country we live in, but because this book is filled with stories about freedom and adding uh, free things into people's lives to open up the expanses of God's good gifts. So not just because it is a word we value, in our country, but because it is something central to this book and to the message of Jesus. So we have to realize and wrestle with what freedom is. Now today's story um, about Jesus is freeing a woman from a physical disability. And Jesus sees her across the way and he sees that there is a problem with how she is able to interact with the space that she is in. She's limited in access to things like the pools of water to do the ritual washings and the altar and the Pharisees and the, the priests around her. Most people are sitting on mats. That's probably a hard thing for her to do and all the spaces that she could lean up against to get relief from the pain are taken by other people. The paths to these important points around the synagogue are crowded with people. So she has to walk out of her way on a longer path to get to where she's going. Even outside of these walls, her life has been limited she probably hasn't found a good match for marriage. She probably doesn't have a great paying, supporting job. She's probably looked down on. She has limits to who she can be in her world because of this physical disability. 
And so Jesus sees this and sees her as an opportunity to show everyone else what they're missing in this moment. He walks over to her, lays his hands on her, and the pain melts away. Her muscles get stronger and the tendons tighten so she can stand up straight. Nothing has changed about her except her ability to stand up. But now she might be able to get a match, a job. She can access the things around her much easier. Not because her personality has changed, not because her talents have changed, not because she's a better work ethic. Nothing about her has changed except for her ability to stand up. Jesus is showing the people there that they have made her disabled. This is a concept that I learned probably in the last year, that communities, society, make disabilities. And it was told to me in a story. The story went like this. Imagine an island somewhere where humans all have the ability to fly, not because they have airplanes or other mechanics on them. They can naturally fly. They're going to build their world and their cities and their towns in a very specific way because they don't need cars, so there won't be any need for roads. Probably uh, phone lines are under the ground because that's a flying hazard. And doors don't have to be on the first floor. Architects can get creative and think about all these amazing different ways to enter a building, from the roof, from the fifth floor. Their world looks very different than ours. And if you or I were to move onto this island, we would suddenly be disabled. Not because of anything has changed about us, but because of where we are. There wouldn't be roads that we need to drive on to get to places. We'd have to have people come out and, and lift us into buildings to try to access those doors that are higher up. If we lived in this community long enough, they might make us some roads, some elevators, some ramps to get up or stairs to get up to those other doors. But there will always be places that we cannot access because we are not in the majority of able-bodied people. Now, when I heard that story, I was like, okay, I don't know. It took me a long time to start to notice how we do this in our world. And I had a conversation with a friend, like, before I heard this story, but it popped into my head after it. And it was a friend of mine named Darren, and he stamps his money with Braille. So he is fully blind, and he was living in a community where the cashier at the local convenience store kept cheating him in his change. He would hand him a 20 and was supposed to get 15, 16 dollars back and only get you know, three $1 bills back. And the people that were helping him that were able, that were cited, uh, were able to say like, hey, that's, that's not what you're supposed to give him. And so Darren had to find a way to help himself in a world that was not going to treat him well because they saw a way to take advantage of him. And so now he has a way to tell what different uh, paper bills are, he can scan them, and then if he's keeping it, he can stamp it with the Braille number on the paper. 
I was actually talking to Marcy right before this and uh, asking if she had a system as well. Uh, and she mentioned that it's actually been said many times since the Disability Act that the um, uh, United States money would put something on it to make our money accessible. It just has never happened yet. In Canada and other places, their money has uh, different things that people can feel are different. But we don't have that yet. And it makes me wonder why. Why don't we make our money accessible? One second. Now we all know disabilities are not just physical. There are financial disabilities, there are age disabilities, being treated differently for lots of different reasons that might disable or limit the way we can access things into this world. When I was a paraeducator in a first grade classroom, I worked with a student who had autism and the parents would come in every once in a while and tell us about their weekend and they would end the story with, I guess we can't go back there now. Their world would get smaller and smaller and smaller. Not because anything was changing about them, but because the places they wanted or needed to go were so committed to rules and etiquette and expectations that when the child did not react in a way that that community, that business wanted, they would either straight up say, don't come back, or the family would get that vibe that this is no longer a space that we can go to. Life can become so limited, not because we're doing anything wrong or different, just by the things that are around us. The leaders in that synagogue were also so committed to rules and etiquette and regulations that they were uncomfortable that Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. This wasn't allowed. But Jesus was in a moment of pointing out the ridiculousness of what was going on, that there wasn't space for this woman to walk or sit or be cared for. This was another chance, and he said, you take your donkey when it's thirsty on the Sabbath. This woman is thirsty for freedom. Why don't we offer her that? He also reminds them that the Sabbath is there to rest from the work of Sunday through Friday. If this woman is still disabled, not because she isn't able to work, isn't able to love someone and be married, isn't able to earn a wage, she can do all of those things, but her world, her society, her community is limiting her access to those things. So if that woman still is limited and disabled, what is the community resting from? Have they done the work that they can rest? These are the hard questions that Jesus puts in front of this community by simply healing this one woman. Not because there's something wrong with her or her body that she needs to be freed from a disability. It is to show the community that a simple change of being able to stand up straight will change her life. And that's not really fair. It's not really the values that that community declares to everyone else. My favorite comic strip is of a school on a very wintry morning, and the custodian is shoveling off the stairs of the school, and there's about 30 kids gathered to get into school to get up those stairs. And as the custodian is shoveling, a child rolls up on a wheelchair and says, can you shovel the ramp? And the custodian goes, there are 30 kids who need the stairs. I'll get to you when I get to you. And the kid goes, 
Well, if you shovel the ramp, we can all use it. We do this. We create more work for ourselves by not creating a world that is accessible to other people. We create systems and ways of living that we would all benefit from if we just took the time to notice how other people are being disabled. This miracle now creates a woman who has lived an experience that hopefully she'll go to them and say, hey, there's another person that's bent over. Can we make a, a path right here? Can you please move? Can you please give them your seat? And she can now help her community see how they disable people and help them expand the access that people have. John actually told me a story about this church and about how uh, if we do make things accessible for other people, how it makes it better for all of us. This elevator that's out here, apparently, was a very difficult thing to get in. It's expensive, probably, you know, destroyed some kind, you know, the, the, the ambiance of the hallway. So there were active uh, oppositions to the elevator. And then someone who was in active opposition needed a walker. So later, years later, they were like, you know, I was on the side that did not want this elevator, but I am very happy that we have this elevator now. So this work isn't just benefiting the people who need it now, it could be benefiting us, we don't know. We don't know what systems we will need as we age or have accidents, as our children grow up. But if we can make this a world that is safe and accessible for everyone, we don't have to worry about what will happen to our bodies in the future. And a lot of these problems are inherited problems. You know, an elevator wasn't needed at one time, and then it was expensive to put in, and so the arguments and the problems are just things that are just passed down to us. For instance, the uh, train uh, tracks are all exactly four feet, eight and a half inches from guard to rail to rail. Seems like an arbitrary number. But that's because the machines that were making wagons were the ones that switched over to start making the train axles. And the reason the machines that were making the wagons were at four feet, eight and a half inches is because there were rutted roads in England that needed to be traversed when they put wagons on, so they had to make them four feet, eight and a half inches, because that's how the ruts were in the road already. And the ruts in the road got there because when Rome came up with their armies and their chariots, their chariots' wheels were four feet, eight and a half inches apart. The train tracks being built in 2022 are being influenced by the chariots of ancient Rome. Some of these things we just inherit, we just don't ask why, we don't ask, can it be better if we change it? Yeah, I'm not saying this is cost effective. But I am saying we have to notice the way we are enacting our values. And if we are choosing not to make our money accessible, we are valuing one experience over another and not making our world more inclusive. We do this with lots of things. We do this with clothes. Yesterday was the first time in my 36 years that I wore a crop top because I have been told that my body is not one that can wear that. We do this with all sorts of things, with clothes, with styles, with professions. We have these strange rules that maybe make sense on some level, but every once in a while we should ask, why? Why can't Jesus heal on the Sabbath? Why can't someone be freed from their limitations 
and given more access on God's day. If someone can't do something that they want or need to do, it is our work to carry some of that burden, some of that discomfort, because they are always uncomfortable. They're always having to buy extra devices so they can mark their money. Marcy had to print out her liturgy in a different way. All these extra things that people have to do that we, if we were a little more uncomfortable, we might be able to make their lives a little bit easier. And by making their lives easier, maybe one day we realize we made our lives easier with an elevator or accessible money or taking the risk to wear clothes that we've been told are wrong. Freedom is not always comfortable. Freedom can be uncomfortable and it is worth it and may we find our ways to work a little bit more discomfort for others. Thanks be to God.
This prayer is based on the idea of shalom. Shalom is often translated peace, but it has two aspects of peace. The first is the aspect of a lack of war and violence. The second, though, is of a fullness of well-being. And so this morning, let us pray. God of creation and blessing, we come on this day seeking your shalom. We seek shalom as peace. We seek peace between nations so one day there will be no more war. We seek peace between those who differ over politics and religion such that neighbors might live in full communion with one another. We seek peace in our city streets so that gun violence will never take another life. We seek peace in our homes so that strife and domestic violence would become a distant memory. Loving God, we seek shalom as well-being. We seek well-being for the homeless that they might find a safe, dry place to live. We seek well-being for those with mental illness that they might find treatment and acceptance and welcome. We seek well-being for those suffering from physical illness that they might be made well and whole. We seek well-being for those struggling to pay their bills that they might find good paying jobs and meaningful work. We seek well-being for those who have suffered loss of any kind that they may on this day and in all the days ahead be comforted. We seek shalom this morning in the name of the one who came and taught his followers these words to pray. Our Father, <clears throat> who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The Lord is merciful. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. May that be the example and may that be what people see as we go about our lives and gather again here again. And when you go, take the peace of God. Peace be with you.